Dear colleagues, uh, for others, it is good morning. This is Ramon Tuason, your AMIC Secretary General. Welcome to AMIC's first ever webinar, E-Teaching in Times of Crisis. This event is part of a series of activities we have planned in preparation for AMIC's 50th anniversary in 2021. Yes, it is our golden anniversary next year. These are challenging times, but we are committed to celebrate this important milestone in our organization's history. I would like to acknowledge Dr. Bradley Freeman, a longtime AMIC member and supporter 
for initiating this event. May I also acknowledge the support of AMIC Board of Management member, Associate Professor Marco Polo, and AMIC Office Manager Fernando Academia for the planning of today's event. Also, Upstream Media PH Philippines, our technology partner and webinar host. Our sincere appreciation to our panelists today, Dr. Malisa Maria Mahmud, Senior Lecturer of Sunway University, Malaysia, Dr. Shai Rashef, President and Founder of University of the People, USA, Dr. Mr. Graham Glass, CEO and Founder of Cyber Learning, Cyber Learning, Associate Professor Marco Polo of De La Salle University, Das Marinas, Philippines. The panel will be moderated by Dr. Freeman, Head of the Department of Communication of Sunway University in Malaysia. Dr. Freeman will explain the mechanics of the webinar. I wish you all a productive webinar. Let us all stay healthy and safe. Maraming salamat po. Thank you very much. Good afternoon and welcome everyone from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. I am Dr. Bradley Freeman, the head of the Department of Communication at Sunway. AMIC has always been there for all of us and this is kind of like a, a plenary, if you will. Uh, and it allows us the opportunity to discuss today the very important issues of our time. And I don't think any of us uh, could have predicted uh, the predicament, uh, the challenge that we would be in today. Uh, but together, we can get through this. And our webinar today is intended to allow for this discussion to occur among all of our AMIC members and among really everyone uh, who is tuning in and and wants to be part of the, the webinar today. Um, I'll tell you uh, in a moment, uh, we have some excellent panelists here for you. Uh, they're gonna give their experiences and some advice. And then we're gonna be taking some questions. We really want to have this be at more of a discussion than anything else. Uh, so just sit tight and get your questions ready uh, because we'll be going to those uh, very shortly. Um, I wanna mention that uh, when I started at Sunway University last semester, uh, in my very first meeting with my faculty, I asked them if we couldn't increase the amount of blended learning that we had in our program. And there were nods around the table thinking we could. And as the semester went on, we figured maybe we could start with one week or, or two weeks uh, in the next semester. Uh, and little did we know that a month or two in advance, we would be asked to convert and, and to transform and to modify our courses for a 100% online format. And I think many of you are in the same situation and some of us are in different situations and we plan to address all of those today. Uh, not only looking at some of the platforms, but also uh, assessment issues, uh, bandwidth issues, student issues. Uh, at, uh, on the one level, we are preparing our classes. On the other level, there are external university realities and global realities that are pushing down and bearing down upon us. Today, we want to talk about some of those issues, offer some insights and advice about e-learning in times of crises. So let me introduce our panel and uh, I will introduce them. Uh, we also heard our Secretary General introduce them, so uh, has meant for them uh, in their respective positions. So joining me today uh, is the President of University of the People, uh, Shai Rashef, he is actually in uh, Geneva right now, joining us from Switzerland. Uh, so thank you for being here. Marco Polo from De La Salle Des Marinas uh, in the Philippines. And we also have Mark, uh, we also have Dr. Melissa Maria Mahmoud. She is here, my colleague at Sunway University. Uh, although we are in separate locations practicing social distancing, of course. Uh, we also had scheduled uh, Graham Glass from Cypher Learning in the States and uh, he, uh, he may be joining us shortly. Uh, so now I just want to turn it over. Uh, let's start with you, Shai Rashef, President of the University of the People. Um, can you tell us uh, where you were when you sort of got the news that uh, all of this was happening? Uh, what have you been doing in your organization and how have you been uh, handling this situation so far? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and uh, thank you for the question. Um, 
University of the People is a non-profit, tuition-free, accredited American online university dedicated to help students uh, who cannot afford going to college otherwise. So we started in 2009, 11 years ago, uh, to serve students such as uh, students who cannot afford higher education because of financial reasons, simply because it's too expensive. We are an American university, and I'm sure all of you know how expensive higher education is in the US. For students who live in countries where there aren't enough universities, such as Africa, where a lot of people are deprived because of a, a lack of seats in the existing universities, people who are deprived who are not uh, allowed to study in universities. And for all these people, uh, we bring the university to them by using online. So we were uh, online from day one, which puts us in a, in a very different situation than, than most universities in the world. And uh, than, than you are in, mo in most cases, because our operation countries, all of them are studying by themselves, but our operation is online as well. Uh, we have people, the majority of our, of our uh, employees, or all of our instructors, and we have 700 instructors, they are all, uh, they are all most of them are in, U in the US, but all of them working remotely from home. We have five offices around the world. We have offices in uh, the US, Europe, Middle East, uh, Asia, uh, but even they mostly work from home. So when the situation happened, we simply closed the office and told the people, you just continue doing what you do all day anyway, but do it from home. Uh, luckily, uh, all of our people were allowed to work from home to start with, so they used to work from home. So, from our perspective, it was it's the, the studies continue seamlessly. People study. Uh, uh, all of our employees were and, and professors are working from wherever they are. All of our students continue studying from wherever they are. We see a difference, but the difference is more on the external effect on our employees or students because we have a few. Uh, employees who uh, got the the virus, and we have students who got the virus. We have students who study from quarantine, uh, but they but what they tell us is, and we have students in in Japan, Korea, China, uh, who tells us, listen, uh, all of our friends will send out of school and they are at home, and it's not clear what will happen to them, and we continue studying seamlessly. It's the same. What what difference does it make? But we do have students who are being sick, and we have students who um, who have financial difficulties, who are laid off, you know, which life affects them. It's not the studies. The studies continue as it was. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yes, uh, we're going to be very interested in uh, hearing from your perspective, because as you said, you've been doing it. And, I'm, and given that you're in so many different countries, you have so many different experiences, uh, we're going to really uh, lean on you today for some of your experiences uh, with regards to that. Um, I have taught, I have developed and taught online courses for U.S. universities, and uh, it is a different experience when you know you're going to be online 100 percent than when you are adapting to it rather uh, in, a, in a quick fashion. Uh, if we, if I may, let's move over to Dr. Melissa now here at Sunway University in Malaysia. And Dr. Melissa, can you tell us uh, where you were when you learned that uh, everything was going online and uh, how have you been preparing for that and what is your experience in general with online learning? Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for being here um, and thank you for uh, the invitation. Um, my name is Melissa and I teach at Sunway University, Malaysia. So when I received the news about um, the course being 100% online, um, I was in a way, very much prepared. Coming from uh, instruction and system development background, I believe uh, I have the uh, extra um, points there because I, I have been trained uh, to basically plan and design my lesson in such a way. Uh, if you don't mind me sharing one specific uh, project, uh, for example, last year in which I have helped one specific 
um, department in Sunway University to completely overhaul uh, their delivery and also their materials to online uh, courses. Um, so scaffolded by different uh, technological tools, we focus on um, changing not only the design, but also the, the, the delivery. Uh, in this case, we encourage the learners to be more active uh, in the learning process. Um, so some of the related practices uh, may include uh, supporting the student to develop uh, online portfolios in which can encourage and allow them to eventually be uh, very much used or familiarized with uh, such online fashion delivery. Um, by involving learners at this um, point, uh, where they are the contemporary producer for not only for their peers but also for the wider public. I think that um, we are able to uh, involve technology uh, supported with the online pedagogy in on, in uh, online pedagogies in which it can enhance uh, the student's learning journey and. And um, on top of that, we also focus uh, on uh, the assessment practices. Uh, using technology, I believe that the assessment are more authentic and, authentic and fluid and flexible. Uh, in this case, I think that uh, adaptive teaching and learning strategies for the online environment um, are definitely the way to go and is such a powerful tool for the educator and also students. Yes, thank you. And uh, we should also mention that we were working on a paper together that looked at all of the studies uh, over many years that investigated student online uh, learning and blended learning. And uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to talk a little bit about that paper uh, later on if, uh, through some of the questions that will come up. Uh, although we're not as much uh, an academic panel today as we are just a discussionary uh, vehicle for those out there who are uh, uh, you know, coming up, having to come up and design new assessments and new ways to engage with their students. Uh, yep. With that in mind, uh, let's go now to Marco Polo. And from uh, um, Good afternoon, everyone, uh, or good morning, wherever you are in other parts of the world. And uh, thank you, Bradley, for uh, this opportunity to uh, be part of this panel. Um, my university is a uh, Catholic university. We've been in existence for 43 years. We uh, actually explored uh, transitioning some of our learning delivery into online about more than a decade ago. And I was one of those who uh, jumped into it and uh, helped in the uh, adoption of um, a learning management system. Uh, when uh, this issue currently happened, we were actually one week into class suspensions already. And we've started really to move most of our classes um, into blended mode and eventually to full uh, distance mode. Though we have, we've been constantly uh, discussing with our students and our, our faculty members and the different stakeholders about how we can uh, best deliver instruction despite the challenges. Even though we're a private university, not all of our students would have access to the internet. And some of them would have difficulty also with even in having their own devices. Um, if you would allow me, I actually prepared a short presentation. Uh, if I would like to share this to the participants on how we've transitioned into this uh, arena, right, of our new normal. So I'm opening up my presentation. I hope it's going to be shared to our participants. So in, in this presentation, I uh, am sharing some principles to uh, the uh, uh, anyone in attendance here who you can uh, look into on how we are able to transition into this uh, challenging times. Um, for our institution, we um, actually um, uh, adopted a uh, dual track uh, mode of um, uh, assisting our students. So uh, there are those who are able to fully integrate the online learning so they can uh, more or less proceed um, with their classes synchronously or asynchronously with their professors. But those who have limited or no internet access, we've also reached out to them so that we're able to uh, provide some uh, assistance to them uh, for them to be able to cope with this uh, challenging times. Now, I'd just like to uh, share to the group that uh, the scenario where we are now in uh, globally today is according to uh, UNESCO, uh, 184 countries now around the world um, have uh, partial or full uh, school closures. And this translates to about 1.5 
a million uh, learners who are finding ways or out of school, uh, uh, practically out of school. And this affects about 63 million educators. That includes uh, us in, uh, in this webinar and on many parts of the world. So in my uh, short uh, presentation today, I'd just like to share some of these key principles that uh, I'd like to uh, share to the group and for you to also think about on how we can uh, uh, cope with uh, learning in these times of crisis. So I call it the CARE2 uh, uh, framework or principles. So it's comprised of the following. So let me just go straight into them. Um, first is uh, the principles of uh, connection and, and, and compassion. So in this time, we need to find a way to, to keep ourselves connected. But at the same time, we have to be mindful of the technological challenges of our students and what they're facing. And uh, we also need to be mindful of the challenges that our teachers are also facing. So uh, whether we use the technology like the internet, uh, online tools or SMS and other ways to reach out to our students or to our learners, we have to be able to find ways to reach out to them. The other thing is we need to be compassionate because uh, our students are also struggling. Even our own uh, co-teachers are also have their own challenges and struggles. In places where there are strict quarantine measures, we need to be able to also understand that students may be sharing their internet connection or their devices with family members. We need to work from home and with other um, uh, learners in the household. So we need to also adjust uh, the delivery of instruction. And uh, with that, we have to be able to, to temper the excitement of really uh, bombarding our students with a lot of activities because, you know, the connectivity issues, their ability to access content uh, will be uh, also uh, hampered because everyone is trying to access a lot of materials online now. The next set of principles would be accessibility and adaptability. So we also have to customize our uh, delivery of instruction to the different kinds of learners that we have. I have a student who um, is dyslexic right now, actually. So I'm trying to deliver a different uh, content to her in a different way. Where are students who, have, who are maybe visually impaired or have other forms of uh, impairments or challenges, we have to be able to ad uh, address their different challenges and, and needs. But the next principle is adaptability. You know? So it, it just goes to show, to show here that the different strokes for different folks, we have to be able to modify our traditional face-to-face -face classroom delivery and be able to find a way to uh, um, adapt to the, to the changing environment uh, with, with our students. We have to be able to, to make sure that they're able to uh, understand the lessons and focus on the key issues that are essential and relevant um, in, in our scenario today. Of course, having uh, backup plans in terms of the delivery. If uh, in case uh, one of our technical tools or technological tools fail, then we have to have backups and other ways of uh, delivering instruction. And then, then the next two principles would be relevance and responsiveness. This semester, I teach public relations. And one of the things I uh, adjusted in my lesson is we talked about crisis PR, which is supposed to be in the final term. So I moved it up a bit because we want to talk about how organizations are responding to the crisis. So we need to look into what are the common interests to our, with our uh, learners and our own interests as, as educators. And we have to find common ground to be able to deliver relevant um, learning to them. And then the next principle is being responsive, trying to, be, to, to make sure that we also uh, follow up students who are not able to, to catch up. In my own classes, I did a survey uh, when uh, this crisis was ongoing and I found out that only 85% of my students have stable, reliable internet connection. So I tried to reach out to the 15% of those students who will not have uh, a regular access to the internet. One is in the mountains and really with really no internet at all. So we communicate via SMS. For some students, they have limited data. So I communicate via email to them. So we try to find a way to uh, uh, empathize with their situation and try to deal with their different challenges. And then finally, um, we, learning should continue and should be uh, engaging to our students. So we have to make sure that the, the learning will be both informative and at the same time entertaining. And that's why this, this is where we teachers will have to be creative, resourceful in finding the different platforms that we can use, the different tools we can use to teach our students how to uh, learn in, 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 in this new environment. I'm fond of playing games in my classrooms. My students know this. So what I've done now is I've transitioned some of my games. I've, I still gamify some of my assessments. 
in such a way that the students will be able to continue to play, but at the same time, no pressure. I allow them have to, 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 to test multiple times so that they don't need to be pressured to just answer one assessment at one time. So uh, we, we call this all together edutainment. And uh, with that, I'd like to uh, thank you all for giving me this opportunity for me to share this framework that you can probably hopefully use uh, to try to adapt to, uh, to our uh, new normal now. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Marco. Uh, we are also joined now on the panel, Graham Glass who's joining us from Cypher Learning as promised. Graham, uh, could you just tell us where you were when things started to uh, unfold and what has this meant for your uh, experience? Yeah, thanks a lot. And by the way, I do apologize for coming late. I think there was a time zone <laughs> mess up on my side. But so I'm located in San Francisco. For those of you that don't know me, I'm the founder of Site for Learning. And De La Salle Das Marinas have been a long term customer of ours using the, the Neo LMS. Um, it's been interesting for us because um, Site for Learning is a virtual company. So unlike, unlike a lot of companies, we don't actually have a main office. So we operate out of 15 different uh, countries. Every country has either engineering or sales or marketing or, or a combination. And so as an organization, we've actually been kind of working remotely and asynchronously for 10 years. Um, so it hasn't actually affected us in terms of the way that we, we work together. Um, it, it feels very similar. The only difference there is that salespeople who might have flown around domestically in various countries um, have stopped it. Um, and we've seen a massive increase in traffic. In one day, it went up 300% in one day. So it kept our engineering team uh, very busy. But as an organization, we've, we've, it's had very little impact. But obviously, to our customers, it's had quite a big impact. Yes, well, thank you very much. Um, we invite uh, those of you who are watching at home to uh, submit your questions. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Fernando of AMIC for running the chat box. And he's taking down uh, the questions. I also take the opportunity to thank Glenn at Upstream Media for hosting us today and, uh, and handling all the behind the scenes actions here for the webinar. Uh, we are in interesting times. Uh, and we've, you've probably been inundated by a lot of articles uh, concerning higher education during this time. I know I have more than an inbox full of people uh, sending various articles uh, on topic A, B, C, or D. And uh, speaking of that, Marco, I, I had to stifle a chuckle a little bit when you, in your presentation, said plan A, B, C, because that's exactly the conversation we had in one of our faculty meetings just a few weeks ago. Uh, we kept on saying, what if this? What if that? Well, that'll be plan A. That'll be plan B. But what if, oh, well, then plan C. And we uh, finally, we were able to hammer those issues out. Fortunately for us, I guess you could say, uh, we were in a semester break period. Uh, our semesters run a little differently than uh, perhaps some others uh, in the world, uh, whereby we have an August semester, we have a January semester, and then we have a March semester. And the March semester was delayed one week this uh, year. And so we'll be starting our semester on Monday. So we did have time to prepare. Uh, and thank goodness we did. And we've, we spent that time wisely. And I can honestly say that uh, most of my faculty, myself, do more work at home than we did uh, when we were coming into the office. And I, I bet you that's true for uh, a lot of our viewers today at the webinar. And that is one of the things you've got to be also developing some uh, limits and some borders, I think, uh, to when you can be messaged and, and when you will respond. You need to be very clear with that uh, because uh, everybody is under stress, not only the students, but also the lecturers. And I think the more that we can maintain a sense of civility and normal, normalcy in our communications, the better. But I do see some questions are already coming in. Uh, so let's go ahead to them right now. Uh, one of our viewers uh, to the webinar today says that students are under uh, in a very stressful situation. And they believe some schools are giving unreasonable assignments and projects. And uh, uh, this uh, commentator would like us to respond to that. Uh, I think that uh, right now we have shifted and many universities have shifted to a pass fail option for the semester rather than letter grades. We want to maintain, of course, our academic standards. There's no doubt about that. However, there's also the issue of, uh, you know, this being un these being unprecedented times. Uh, so uh, what would you say to that, uh, Melissa, 
uh, students are being stressed out. Are we are we are we in trouble if we just move our uh, our face to face classes immediately online without taking into consideration the changes that online learning uh, requires? Okay, uh, to address the issue or the question, I believe that communication, clear communication at the very beginning of the semester is the most important. Um, you need to set the tone very clearly um, during the first lesson itself. Uh, at that point, you need to be able to uh, inform your students, okay, uh, different means on how you can be contacted and different means on how they can be supported. Because uh, coming from students' point of view, they, like I said, like you mentioned, this is unprecedented. Um, I think it is normal for them to have anxiety, to experience anxiety. Therefore, um, sense of assurance in ways in which we communicate information to them is the utmost importance. I did mention earlier uh, regarding uh, the assessment, the design of your assessment. It has to be uh, adaptive to the situation, the circumstance. Uh, for example, it has to be... Um, uh, students focus and it has to be flexible, it has to be fluid. Um, I think, um, and at the same time, we have to maintain the academic standard. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, uh, Marco, this one is for you. How do we reach learners without internet? You mentioned that you had some who, uh, who do struggle with that. I, I had an international student who contacted me who is from Japan but living here in Malaysia. Uh, she said she did not have internet access uh, via Wi-Fi. She was on a prepaid cell phone. Now, fortunately, the, uh, the telcos here in Malaysia are offering one gigabyte free every day. And that's really helping us out because that was an immediate solution to that problem. But how are you handling it there? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, in our case, we, the university has liberalized its approach in terms of offering distance learning. And for our students who so do not have internet access, who have absolutely no internet access, they have been notified that um, they will be receiving uh, their lessons uh, through our learning management system uh, via email, which they can access upon resumption of classes, and they can submit their assessments uh, towards the end of the semester. Our semester ends sometime in May. So hopefully, all when, uh, if and when classes resume, face-to-face -face classes resume, our students who don't have internet access can submit um, their assessments and their other uh, portfolios at the end of the semester. But right now, continue the conversation with them. For the students uh, in my classes who don't have internet, it's via SMS. So just last night, I was messaging one of these students who was uh, in one of the provinces, and uh, there's no internet in their area. So I just tried to update her, uh, tried to let her know and assure her that she, she need not worry about the lessons she's going, going to be missing in the online mode because uh, she'll be able to catch up when uh, classes resume, hopefully, uh, in the near future. So that's what we've been trying to utilize now, SMS. We also try to have a body system with our students who live nearby, some of the other students, although there's physical distancing or social distancing right now. But we try to tell them that they can try to reach out to students in their own communities and try to, to, to use different ways of communication. I know in some places in our province, uh, community radio is still very strong. You know, the two-way radio. So there are radio groups that actually pass on messages using this mechanism. So that's an interesting way of uh, adapting to, to these challenging times. And you, as, uh, students are using uh, pocket radios to communicate with each other, not necessarily with their teachers, but with fellow students as well. So we really have to be very creative about trying to utilize the available tools uh, despite the limitations of, of access and the technologies uh, available. Yes, I recognize when you say the distance learning with the radio that there were a number of studies out of Australia uh, in the earlier days of distance learning that, that were dealing with that. We were also uh, seeing some universities, uh, a public university here in Malaysia, put out uh, a pamphlet for their lecturers describing uh, what to do if the internet bandwidth is low, medium, or high, uh, giving examples of you know the speeds for this and uh, discussing certain apps that might be more apropos depending on the bandwidth as well as the approaches and the actions that could be taken so this is something that universities should consider as well perhaps putting out guidelines for their lecturers in these situations um, i want to take the next question over to shay of uh, uh, president of university of the people 
Uh, the question is, how do we make sure the learner is the one answering the online exams? <laughs> okay. Well, this is a question that uh, we have for many years and <laughs> with no connection to the corona. Uh, in a way, um, after saying that when you think about uh, traditional universities and think about uh, PhD candidates who write the dissertations, how do you really know that they wrote the dissertation and not someone else wrote it for them? So I leave this question aside and I will answer. Uh, today, there are, there are a lot of ways to verify the, the students. So our pedagogy, and, and I haven't got into it, it's a peer-to-peer -peer learning. Uh, the students communicate between themselves and uh, under the supervision of the instructor, and, and we get to know the students very well all the way. Uh, students every week have to, to, um, to communicate with each other. They have to talk about the topic of the week. They have to take an, a quiz. They have to write a homework, which is assessed by, by their peers, actually, under the supervision of the instructor. And then they get to the final exam. When they get to the final exam, our final exams are being proctored. Now, proctoring has, in our case, two options. And those of you who heard me before, I said that a lot of our students are those who have no other, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> have no have no other opportunity. People who come from hardship, <clears throat> I'm sorry, people who, uh, who come from hardship and as such um, need a lot, a lot of support. They cannot afford paying anything. We are tuition free. We give them, we charge the students only for the exams. And if they don't have the money, we give them scholarship even for that. But that means that when they come to the proctoring, we give them two options. Either give us a name, a, a, a person, a live person that we verify, that we vet, and then send the exam to that person and ask the, uh, the students to go and take the exam in front of them, or do online proctoring. Now, there is online proctoring. There are quite a few companies out there, and there are a lot of methods of online co uh, co uh, proctoring. Either a live proctoring, where, like we are now, the students sit in front of a video, takes the exam, and someone watch them, that it's really them. They identify themselves with the with the ID card, and then take the exam and someone watch them. That's the method that we're using. By the way, there are others, voice recognition, a fingerprint, a typing style. There are a lot of, a lot of methods to, to verify what we do. We tell the students either um, go to a physical uh, proctor or take online exam via video. Uh, students who um, these days, um, we help the students because it costs a little bit money. It's not expensive at all, but it still costs a little bit. And students who cannot afford even paying that, we help them. But to make a short answer of your, uh, to make it short, uh, verifying the students is being done through a online a video conferencing. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Yes, we do have a lot of questions coming in now. Uh, as our uh, viewership increases here and our participants to the webinar. Um, so Graham, how do we, uh, uh, do you think that online learning in times of quarantine evolved from an individual to a family learning affair? Uh, do you have any experiences there? Uh, and, and what we mean, I think what they mean yeah. by that is that a lot of uh, learners now have their family involved and they might be asking them for questions. I suppose this kind of dovetails with the, how do we know if it's there, if they're the ones answering. Oh, and, I see, I see, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, well, I mean, is, I mean I, I've got a young boy and so he does his little bit of online stuff in the mornings and he really enjoys it. And my wife actually joins in and it's like quite a kind of a family group. Um, but I think as, as uh, and one of the things that I did before we had any big exam, I actually would say to them, there's lots of different ways to cheat and there's no way that I can possibly tell whether, whether anyone's cheating. I mean, within reason. So I said, if you want to cheat, you're really ultimately only cheating yourself. And I would actually tell them you might get a good grade and you go for your job and you're going to fail in the job because you're not really as good as you thought. And deep down, it's going to eat away at you because you know you're a cheat and you're a fraud. So I try and build it up so that the student themselves realize they're only actually cheating themselves in the long term. That was that was my British sensibility, 
the very super low tech, no biometrics. But yeah, it's certainly true that, you know, more and more people are at home. And I guess it's quite nice if you have a younger brother and an older brother can help each other out as a study group. It actually works out quite well. And for higher learning, I think that uh, one of the things we can also notice, it may not be true for our first semester students, but for those who have been with us, I think that certain lecturers might be able to uh, take a look and see, well, gee, this student has been a BC student. And now all of a sudden they're acing everything. Uh, we might want to have a talk with them and say uh, the very uh, items that you'd mentioned that you're only cheating yourself in, in these regards. Uh, actually, certain... I have one other very quick anecdote though, because I remember at college uh, when I was just in the first year and there was one uh, lady student I had a big crush on and she was falling behind in her work. So I kind of helped her out behind the scenes and helped, you know, she copied some of my code and I thought, well, you know, it's worth it. And the professor found out because he compared the papers. And so he brought me into the office and said, Graham, you're obviously a very good student, but I'm actually going to give you a C for your semester because if you share your work, you share the grade. And after then, I never, ever <laughs> shared anything ever again. That's a great story. Um, right. Marco, can you suggest some measures and techniques as to how we can engage students in a better way in the online format? Um, thank you for that uh, question. To me, since uh, like now I teach public relations uh, this semester, in terms of student engagements, I allow my students to, we have our uh, window in which we can communicate with each other uh, during the week because I know they would have other classes where teachers might want to communicate with them. So we set specific schedules. It's no longer a totally synchronous discussion, but whoever is online can post a question or share something, and then anyone can jump in and share in the discussion. And what I do is I curate this information so that I'll be able to eventually look at the quality of their uh, discourse in, in responding to some of the issues and in, into the discussions. Now, uh, one way also to encourage students to be not afraid of taking on the assessments is that I allow them to take it multiple times. Um, I have a question bank in some of my assessments. So if it's like, a, like if it's a 20 item um, assessment, I, have, I would have about 100 questions there. They can take it as many times as they want until they master the concepts. So I found that that's one of the ways in which it encourages the students to try to keep learning and be mindful of the, the fact that they're given a second, third or fourth chance to be able to master the concept. So those are some of the things that I've done in my own classes to uh, encourage them to be more engaged and, and participatory. Also, uh, one last thing though, um, in terms of recitation, because you know, in, in, in the online modality, there are students who are not at, not very good at typing. You know? That's one of the things some students say, uh, we've, we've lost the ability to, to, to write well, express well, or to type well, or to type very fast. So I also allow them to share videos. You know? um, uh, I use apps like Flipgrid where students can share video responses to a question and that's, uh, and, and that's a way it allows them their own uh, three minutes of fame to be able to share their ideas on a concept and allow other students to react uh, to their own answers to a particular question that I pose. And again, this is, um, I give them enough time to respond. I don't pressure them that you only have like a few hours to do this uh, given the situation so that they're able to construct uh, carefully their responses and, and uh, share it to, to their classmates. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, we do have so many questions uh, coming in and we uh, probably not enough time to answer all of them, but let me try to uh, get some of these here and offer uh, quick answers if, I, if we can. Um, one of our uh, uh, participants says, how do you address the internet capability of some students? Could you give specific examples in handling such? Well, I think we, we did address that. Uh, one of the things we did here in the Department of Communication at Summer University was we did an online survey of our students to find out <clears throat> uh, what technology they had and how they connect to the internet. We are very fortunate that around 90% of our students have access to uh, a laptop uh, and or a uh, cell phone and home Wi-Fi. Now that's very important because uh, you, you, you kind of need that if you're going to do the higher level versions of the online learning. Um, the, so just do a survey of them and, and get that information. I know that uh, some of my colleagues in other departments had situations where students uh, did not have the right technology and they're working to try to uh, find a solution for them. Um, <clears throat> uh, number seven, how do you 
uh, ensure an effective assessment online? Melissa, I'll give that one to you. How do okay. we do assessments online? Okay, so um, I think it's a great question because uh, I'm in the midst of uh, preparing for my final exam. Uh, with the announcement uh, yesterday for the entire semester to be completely 100% online, uh, so one of the changes uh, that we have to do is to convert the traditional uh, final exam to online. Uh, some of the suggestion was to... Um, look into the design of the assessment itself. For example, perhaps we can look into case study a more application type of questions instead of uh, those normal questions that we typically ask a student. Um, for me personally, I am still looking at um, how I will eventually deploy the uh, online final exam because there are so many limitations and there are so many variables that we have to consider. Uh, I did read a lot of articles on, uh, on proctoring and I did also uh, read an article on how we can secure some browsers so that um, a verification of ID can be done safely. Uh, this is to ensure that we, we uh, the students are the actual students sitting for the exam. Um, uh, in terms of logistic, I think um, there are also so many uh, questions which I'm yet to uh, discover the, the answers. Uh, but in terms of the design of the question itself, I think uh, we have to be more adaptable to the situation uh, in a way that we, we look into a more um, application type of uh, question, for example, case study, um, perhaps uh, they, are, they, they can watch um, video, then they react or respond to the video rather than um, a linear type of question. Okay, thank you for that. Some of our other questions, uh, I believe, uh, that have been asked, we have answered. Uh, some were asking more about uh, teaching techniques and tools, and um, also uh, how do we address those who don't have internet or not such great internet. I think we've addressed those. Um, one of the questions uh, that did come in is, uh, can uh, can e-learning compensate for the human touch of teachers? And uh, you know, that's always a biggie. Face-to-face um, -face is great. Uh, in this situation, you know, we're not going to have that, and so we have to do the best we can with the tools we have. Uh, having worked in radio for a number of years, I can tell you that uh, you know uh, there were there was a relationship that formed between listeners whom I had never even met um, because they were able to listen and learn and and understand my voice and what I was talking about. So I believe we can make these connections uh, that uh, you know it doesn't have to necessarily be face-to-face -face per se. Um, Graham or Shay, I'll let you handle this next one. Uh, we've been hearing some reports that Zoom meetings uh, is, is having some trouble with uh, Zoom bombers, those who are getting into the classes. I guess uh, some folks are not using passwords. Um, how can we ensure a safe environment when teaching virtually using various platforms? So I think you just answered it, <laughs> use passwords. <laughs> it's quite yeah. simple. It's like if you don't use a password, you open yourself, apply a password, and no one's going to Zoom bomb you. Yeah, and I, I did see an article also, uh, which I'm sure that you could search. Uh, they, they came up with five, five ways that you could uh, prevent this from happening. Uh, and uh, I, passwords was the, the, the big takeaway from that one. Uh, which is kind of a no-brainer in that sense. I wonder if there are other platforms that may be uh, experiencing some malware or some issues. Uh, I haven't read about them. I think Zoom gets a lot of the attention right now because it's such a popular program. Uh, I know that uh, at Summer University, we have uh, gotten Zoom Premium or Pro for all of our lecturers, uh, and that's going to help a lot in their ability to, uh, especially with tutorials, I would think. Yeah. Well, I think I think one of the things about Zoom is is that the Zoom meeting, if you don't put a password, it's just six digits. Um, and so, given the number of people who are online right now and the number of people who just want to fiddle around all day long, they're going to occasionally just find find a meeting by random. Um, if they simply made that eight digits instead of six, that would probably solve the problem as well. So, my guess is that Zoom will probably figure out a way to make those numbers a little bit bigger very quickly. 
Okay, um, num we've got another one. Uh, I'm teaching production classes this semester, multimedia journalism. Uh, it involves going out and getting stories in the field, but with the current situation, it will be impossible to send them out. Any ideas on how to teach output-based courses? Well, this is, this is a difficult uh, question for, for any of us. Uh, I have taught that those very classes. Uh, certainly, journalism can occur online. You can uh, get your interviews through the online platforms, and you can still develop and use uh, Audacity You know, as a free uh, software online, and uh, there are others for video as well, although I'm not as familiar with those. Um, so it is possible to still uh, engage uh, the students in those classes and uh, without them necessarily going out into the field. Um, there are a number of softwares that are allow are giving 90 days free or two months free. Uh, so you might be able to, uh, you know, to, to do that. There, there may also be the possibility if you're, if you have a class that's absolutely not uh, available online, uh, that you could delay that class until the next semester and in its place swap a class from a future semester in there. So if you have a class in the fall that makes sense online and you have one here in the spring that doesn't, maybe you could swap those uh, if it's not too late already. If you're already in the situation, obviously you do the best you can. Um, Shay, uh, another uh, participant says, what happens if some students do not communicate in various platforms? I imagine with University of the People, you have a lot of people who sign up, their intentions are good, but then they just kind of fail to communicate. What, what happens to students like that in, the, in your university system? I guess that the first thing to notice is that anyone who tries to come and say, I teach face-to-face -face courses, now I move online and just use Zoom and do the same thing, it won't work. Working online is not working face-to-face -face, and we should understand that. It's a different platform and we should adjust what we do in order to teach it properly. As such, in our case, first of all, we have an orientation. The orientation both for the professors, how to work online, and for the students, how to study online. Second, uh, we do not believe in lecturing online. We believe in peer-to-peer -peer learning. You need the students to interact with each other. The beauty of the internet is that they can interact much more than when they sit in class, listen to the professor, maybe falling asleep, I don't know, taking notes from their friends. Online, they need to participate and they have to participate and they can study from each other. Our entire pedagogy is peer-to-peer -peer learning. Students teach each other and learn from each other. At the same time, the role of the professors is to be in the class and be monitored. He should monitor, the, he, she should monitor the discussion, answer the questions, correct mistakes, but not lecturing. Second, uh, so we believe in, in collaborative learning. We believe in peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, we, we think that uh, students must have the discipline and, this, and the motivation in order to study online. You need to be much more motivated. And you're right, some students, it's not for them. Now, in these days, where well, everyone is forced to study online, it's a challenge because some fail to participate, as you said, because it doesn't suit them. They don't feel comfortable in this setting, but they need to be trained. And they need to be and they need to be educated how to do it right. You know, one of the things that that, that uh, is, is actually we are very proud of is our peer to peer learning, which means that students communicate with each other. They assess each other's work and give grades to each other. So actually, the students are the teachers. Now, this is tough, not only that they need to be taught, they need to accept it culturally and mentally, because a lot of students at the beginning say, hey, who is my fellow students to give me grades? We, why is it the authority to determine my grade? Well, it needs time to understand. First of all, we obviously give the, the professors the right to override any grade, but uh, we tell them how powerful it is and how much they can learn from each other. And, um, and, and we actually encourage them. And after a while, that's the thing that the students likes, likes most about our program. All I'm saying is that now we are in a tough situation. We are all forced to go online and teach and not necessarily with the knowledge and also not with the enough time to build the courses properly. It takes us a month, month, of almost a year to build one course to be right online. Well, we don't, you don't have the time. All the world doesn't have the time and the expertise how to do it right because a professor that is being asked to teach online is not instructional designer who knows how to do it right. So we are in tough time. We, we need to imp improvise. 
but we need to understand that we want to make the students as much engaged as possible. I don't think that video is the answer. They can be texting to each other if they don't have good connectivity, but as long as they participate, uh, they will, that will be part of the answer. I absolutely agree with you, and it's true. Um, when developing a class for online, it uh, and I have done it, it takes several months, uh, and you, you are constantly tweaking it, and even when it uh, starts, to, even when it launches, you're still making adjustments. You're always doing that, and it, it's a different ball game. It's, it's a different situation. Uh, it is unfortunate. Uh, well, I, I consider it fortunate in a way because I was asking my faculty if we could do one or two weeks. And now here is my dream. Uh, we're, we're doing, uh, well, my dream wasn't 100%. It was more like 50%. But, uh, you know, we're kind of moving there quicker than we thought. But I absolutely uh, take to heart your message of if you're a, a lecturer and you're just thinking I'm going to pop up on Zoom and do what I did, that's not going to work. Uh, you need to have to develop different ways. And, you know, assessments are a big issue here. Uh, in my online classes, uh, the assessments are smaller and more often. Uh, and they're also somewhat automatic in terms of uh, what I'll usually do is have a discussion one week and then a small written assignment the next week. Uh, and then I will have a discussion uh, thread the next week that requires them to use their voice and their, their, their video picture through voice thread. Uh, on Blackboard. And uh, so there are a lot of different tools out there and different techniques. Uh, I do not require for my faculty members to use one particular uh, platform across the board. Uh, I leave it to them to decide. And I'm hoping that the, the things we learn this semester are going to help us to get to that 30, 40, 50% in the proper way in the, in the, fu in the future semesters. I don't expect it to, to be perfect uh, right now. It can't be actually. Um, uh, Melissa, one of the other questions came uh, from uh, someone who was asking about rubrics. Uh, do you have different, and I saw Graham, you had your hand up there. Did you want to try? Yeah, I, I was actually going to add something which I think okay. was fairly important just to the last point you were making, which is I think the biggest shift towards online learning is starting to think uh, asynchronously. In other words, it's a lot of the time the instructor and the student are not going to be online at the same time. And one of the things that we've done a really good job in our Neo LMS is supporting something called automation. Um, and automation is the idea that with some clicks, you can set up automatic actions that will be taken when certain things happen in the system. So as an instructor, you can sprinkle your course with all degrees of automation and go to sleep. And as the students go through, certain things will happen based on your own expertise. For example, simple things. When you enroll in the class, 10 minutes later, pop up a little video, welcome them to the class, 100 points towards gamification. You can also do things like if you get over a certain quiz score, automatically uh, reveal a hidden lesson with, with advanced materials. Or if they're falling behind in a particular competency for more than two days, automatically show some remedial material. Obviously, that takes a bit of thinking, but those are the, that, that's a huge difference taking a lesson class like that than taking one which is literally just click, 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 and nothing really happens except you get to the end of the course. And do it, uh, if you can do it in a few in a few hours. So giving the students the opportunity to do it anytime, anywhere is a great advantage. Yeah. I think though we do need to set those uh, office hours, you know, when we can be contacted uh, to the students. Otherwise, you know, we're gonna be reacting every every few minutes. So I, I think setting those limits uh, for you know each person that will have to develop that. But if you're a lecturer and you're you're constantly feeling like you're getting bombarded by many students, you have the power to uh, you know to affect that change uh, in in your own way. Still being mindful and still being compassionate to the students who are under your care, the the sheep in the flock, as I like to sometimes say. Um, yeah. Um yeah. I would like to add, uh, Brad, uh, regarding uh, students' concern. I think uh, just to add to what you have said and to what Shai uh, mentioned earlier, I think it's paramount for us to empower students. We have to change our mindset in which the students uh, are the most important stakeholders here. And um, they become better learners. And uh, to address the questions on the rubric, you still want me to address the, the question? Yes, we did have one on, did, did your rubrics change uh, in, in when you shifted to the online? You feel they're more effective uh, online than they were face-to-face? -face, or what is your 
experience with that? I think at this point, uh, rubric is one of the best options because rubric integrates a broad range of functional, technical and pedagogical criteria. Uh, however, it is not to be overly prescriptive. Um, you may have a framework in response to what you want to achieve in regards to your learning outcome. For example, uh, when a rubric criteria is not relevant to the assessment of a particular tool, it can be uh, excluded without impacting the overall quality of the assessment. Okay, thank you. And another question we had was, how do we assess teachers' effectiveness in the online environment? Well, that's up to us, uh, head of departments and program leaders. We will uh, be popping into their classes, uh, not to make them more stressed out, but really just to ensure that the learning is taking place and that the students are being uh, getting that content that we promised them from the university side. So uh, those of us who are in administration, that's part of our responsibility. At the same time, uh, you know, every everything uh, is, is taken with a, a little bit of a pinch of salt during these unprecedented times. Uh, yeah. and, and our goal should be as administrators to help and support the faculty as much as we can, uh, at the same time upholding our academic standards, which we absolutely must do. Marco, uh, one of the questions that came in, and we are running out of time, so we're going to take one or two more questions, and then I'm going to ask each of you for your wrap-up takeaways uh, for mm -hmm. e-learning in times of crisis. But uh, this one is one that I think this is really for administrators to a large degree, but perhaps you have colleagues like this. We had a couple of questions who were saying uh, there, are, there are teachers who are reluctant to take advantage of using available ICTs. They don't like online learning, and um, how, do, how best to encourage them to do so? And I'm, I'm reminded of uh, one of my mentors at, at Syracuse University, uh, uh, Dr. Comstock, uh, he was very well known for not using the, the computers at all. In fact, if you wanted to email him, we would email his secretary. She would print them out and take them in in the morning. He would respond on paper and she would respond later uh, at the end of the day. So I don't know, Dr. Comstock, I don't think is actively teaching right now. Uh, I don't think he would be very fond of this time. How do we encourage them? What do we say? How do we help them? Uh, that's a very good question. We went through that experience in my university. But uh, one of the things that the university did was it piloted the uh, learning management system first before implementing it institution-wide. And when the university was able to identify people who were willing to adopt the technology, they were tapped to become e-learning e champions. And they basically trained other teachers. Uh, eventually, more teachers uh, jumped into the system. And uh, there's a lot of hand-holding. Like right now in my department, we have one faculty. She has no internet access at all. Uh, she's a bit isolated. So what we did was uh, we converted her classes, and some of us are now teaching assistants in her classes. So we're still able to continue to reach out to her, to her students, despite her uh, inability to go online. We communicate to her via SMS, and she gives us instructions on what are the lessons that needs to be given, et cetera. So uh, in, in, in a way, you really need for the buy-in here, you, you really have to walk the talk and you have to really show that it, it works. Uh, in, in our department, since the university has adopted uh, a new LMS, um, the administrators can monitor the uh, faculty members' usage uh, of the system. And if you say that you're going online and yet you're not there, then the, the administrators can uh, call on the faculty members' concern that, hey, you said you're going to be online today and yet you're not. So it's, it's done in a way that is compassionate and it's, it's done in a way that uh, doesn't embarrass the professors, but it, it's in a way that we try to encourage each other that given this new normal now, we really have to uh, find a way to be able to continue the learning process. And the teachers who have difficulty adapting, we really have this body system of trying to um, uh, encourage those who have mastered a certain level of usage of the system to reach out to those faculty members who are still trying to learn uh, the system. As, as, as uh, Alvin Toffler said, the illiterates of the 21st centuries are those who are not willing to relearn, learn and unlearn. And we're in that scenario right now. And that's why we have to be very much willing to, to adapt to these different changes. Shay, I uh, know you want to yeah, jump in I, there and then Graham, please. 
I'm 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 terribly sorry, but we are three minutes behind behind the hour, and I have another show that started three minutes ago. <laughs> I have to okay. excuse myself. <laughs> sorry, it was great being with you. Yeah, I apologize, but I have yeah. to leave. Sorry. Thank you for thank you for being with us today. Thank and, you. Uh, thank, thank you for the work you do at University of the People. I'm sure thank many you. of our participants today will check it out online. Uh, I've been thank an early supporter of University of the People uh, since back when it was first uh, founded. Uh, and thank so we you thank so you for much. your work and we thank you for being here uh, on our webinar today. Thank you. Yeah, I, I wanted to add one quick thing just about um, introducing people to online learning. I think it's really important that they can see right from the beginning some really good examples of how great it can be. Because there are some online courses I've seen that are just absolutely awful. And if I was a teacher used to teaching live and I saw this course, I'd go, oh my God, it's like going backwards. But for example, at De La Salle, they've done some fantastic stuff with Neo, with gamification, for example. So uh, one of the one of the uh, teachers there, for example, set up these very elaborate gamifications, whereby if you've got a certain number of points, then the top three people, for example, could decide that the teacher would say, you can raise a grade by one point if you actually get a certain number of points. Or if you get to a certain badge level, then you don't have to turn up for one of your exams and you get an automatic A. So suddenly everyone is like massively incented to do well in all the other areas of the course because they know that they get these really cool bonuses. So I do think just p opening people's eyes to what's possible in a, in, a, in a good online platform will really have a positive impact. Thank you very much for that. Um, I do wanna mention that participants today will be given e-certificates and highlights of the webinar. We will also send an e-evaluation form uh, so that AMIC can get feedback from everyone watching today. And perhaps if you have some ideas for future webinars, uh, then we'll be interested to hear from you. Uh, I do know that we do have uh, one in the works on how to get published in academic journals, because I imagine a lot of us are uh, looking to increase our research output uh, during this time. We have a lot of time to read. Uh, as well as, uh, of course, doing our online work. Um, so I think that uh, we also uh, want to mention the AMIC Asia Awards are open for nomination. And uh, we are going to uh, be, we have recorded this session and we hope to make it available on the AMIC website uh, for those of you who would like to share it with uh, some of your colleagues or others who you think might benefit from some of the information that we've been able to share here today. So don't worry about that. Uh, again, thanks to Fernando, uh, who has been running uh, the chat box and providing me with my uh, talking points and also Glenn at Upstream Media uh, for hosting us today. Uh, I, we don't want to take everybody's a uh, lot of your time, although we do have somewhat of a captive audience, I do imagine. But of course, if you're like me, you have a lot more work going on uh, at home than you may have even at the office. I know that's true for me. I've, I've had a lot more going on uh, since I've been at home. Uh, fortunately, I've been able to get into a routine that I think uh, is very helpful. Uh, I realize that not everybody is in the same circumstance. Not everybody has a, a room even where it can be quiet uh, for one hour. And uh, I commiserate with you there and I, I hope the best for you. And let's hope together that by washing our hands, staying indoors, social distancing, and let's hope the medical professionals also will come to the rescue as I believe they, they will. Uh, in helping us to, uh, to uh, overcome the current situation we're in. And before you know it, we'll be back to back, uh, back online face to face. But uh, I think that online is gonna continue to be important and it's an area that we've gotta continue to increase our blended learning. The amount of blended learning that we have uh, is gonna be super important in the, in the future. If this, does, if this case doesn't show us that, I don't know what will. So let's go around the horn right now uh, and just give a couple minutes uh, again, I want to thank uh, all of our participants out there. A lot of our questions coming in from the Philippines and India. They're our top participants today. Um, I did ask for names and locations. So maybe we'll be able to get that into the next webinar because I do want to acknowledge the folks out there who are watching and are viewing us. Uh, we did have some questions also coming in from the YouTube chat. Uh, I believe that we've, we've covered a lot of those in the uh, the question and answer session here, but we do need to wrap things up. We don't want to take uh, your entire day. So let's go around the horn right now with parting shots and takeaways uh, from our webinar, from our online experience in these unprecedented times. Graham, let's start with you. 
Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned, I used to teach computer science at UT Dallas, and then I actually founded a professional training company. So I've done a lot of teaching myself. And I went through the curve, I mean, the, the learning curve of going from synchronous teaching, which is what I always did, to running a company that works completely asynchronously. And moving to an asynchronous company ended up making us a much stronger company. And it definitely improved the way that I think about how I teach people, how I learn from people. So I do think though, it is definitely unpleasant for everyone going through this thing, but with the right, right mindset, I think people will actually come out as much stronger educators uh, as a result of it. I definitely agree with you there. I've told my faculty as well that preparing for online helps you relearn certain aspects of your course. It makes you a better teacher overall. And, uh, and taking online classes is also great. I've taken uh, some, several of the MOOCs online and I think we're always learning and we're always adapting and, and, and especially in these times. Uh, let's go over to Marco, if you could uh, give us your takeaways there from the Philippines and De La Salle. Yeah, uh, thank you uh, uh, Bradley for uh, the opportunity and to AMIC. Uh, I go back to my uh, presentation earlier, which talks about uh, to care also Take care of yourself, take care of your family, take care of your students, take care of your loved ones, because this is the new normal now. And we really have to uh, see the opportunity in these difficult times to enable us to continue the, the teaching, the learning and the sharing process. So I hope that uh, everyone will uh, find ways to deal with these uh, circumstances. And uh, I look forward to one day seeing each other again physically and you know, uh, continuing our learning and conversations. And uh, again, thank you for this opportunity to be part of this webinar. Thank you for being part of the webinar. Now over to Melissa. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, as I spoke to you, yeah, uh, Brad, one of my teaching philosophy is I strive to be relevant for all my students. And unfortunately, the fast forward button has been pushed onto the reality for all of us to embrace uh, e-learning. Uh, let's just use this opportunity um, for the betterment of our students. Stay safe. Thank you for that. And it's been very uh, enlightening here, the webinar this afternoon, uh, Southeast Asian time. There are some webinars going on in Europe and in the States. The timings don't always work for us here in Southeast Asia or Asia in general. So that's why I think it was important for us to have this. And so, Amic, I'd like to thank Amic for uh, allow, getting it together and getting it up there. Uh, I know that uh, we, the Amic conference will be missing that this year. And so, uh, I think these webinars are very important, uh, a chance and opportunity for us to get together, to say hello and to start a dialogue. And I hope we can have uh, uh, more webinars, more interactions. Uh, very pleased to uh, see that we had over 260 uh, attendees to our webinar today and countless others watching uh, through the YouTube platform and other platforms where it's been made available. And so I'd like to thank everybody for uh, showing up to our webinar today and being a part of this. Uh, these are trying times. These are unprecedented times. But together, we're going to get through it. And thank you, Amic, for our webinar. Thank you, Glenn at Upstream Media. Thank you, Fernando, uh, behind the scenes, taking the chat box. I, I think we managed to get to the majority of the questions, if not actually every single one of them. Uh, but perhaps we can save that for another time. So once again, everyone, i uh, like to say goodbye from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, and Sunway University. And on behalf of De La Salle University, University of the People, Cypher Learning, and De La Salle in the Philippines, uh, thanks everybody for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Thanks right. a lot. Hey, and thanks a lot, Brad. You did a great job. Bye. Bye bye. bye.